get started. Again, welcome uh, for those who are just joining us now to In the File Unexpected Design Stories. Um, we're, uh, you know, if you're just joining us today, uh, we're going to be talking with, with Gautam and Matt about uh, their unexpected design stories. Um, and let's click, click uh, excuse me, kick it off with the first presentation. And I believe, uh, Gautam, you're, go you're going first, correct? Yes. Yeah, that's correct. Wonderful. Right. So I'll stop sharing now. And if you just want to go ahead and get started. Of course, just a moment. Um, is my screen visible? Looks great. <laughs> great. So uh, I'll start off. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for taking out the time for this session and to hear our stories. So my story is titled, Can an Accountant Be a Designer? And of course, the answer is yes. Um, I, be, I strongly believe that everyone can design and in our company, we, we have a lot of accountants who joined us in product roles and a lot of them have learned design. And I will share stories uh, of one key accountant. So as you can see in this picture, his name is Vivek. He's from India. He worked as an accountant and then he joined Vision Planner as a product owner and he works from his home in India these days. And he is the accountant who completely learned design. And uh, I will discuss how Vivek and I, we, we talk about design in Figma and how we make products for our customers in Figma. At the same time, this is to some extent also my story as how I was able to uh, get, get these people to design and then how, how this became a great process for us. So a very short introduction, I think has already been introduced. Uh, my name is Gaurav, I come from India. I work as the design manager at Vision Planner, which is a Dutch company. You can see this is the CEO of Figma, Dylan, who I found at an event in Amsterdam. And I'm, like I said, a huge fan of Figma and you know why. So just a bit of more uh, context uh, around this, um, around Vision Planner. So what does Vision Planner do? So what Vision Planner basically does is that uh, Vision Planner makes software which can be used by Dutch accountants. And then those accountants help the Dutch entrepreneurs and mostly small and medium enterprises, small and medium businesses who, whose financial performance is uh, improved through this accounting software. So currently Vision Planner serves around 2000 Dutch accounting offices with roughly around 140,000 users. So they all use this product, which we make and design to, to do their job well and to ultimately help the entrepreneurs perform well. So a little bit of my story in Vision Planner, I joined roughly three years back in 2018. And when I joined, uh, I was the only designer with around uh, 30 developers. And this has now changed to the only designer with 90 developers. So, so we have really grown fast. We have really scaled up, but design has not scaled up that well at least before we started using Figma. So in 2018, when I joined, I was working on one established product, which is a Vision Planner core offering and one web app. And life was okay. I was using some other design software. Life was good. But come 2020, and we had two whole web-based applications planned. In 2021, they are going to be launched and some of our users are using the early versions already. So suddenly my work kind of exploded. Now, I mentioned that there are around 90 developers I'm working with. And among those 90 developers, roughly 50 are in India and 40 are in the Netherlands. And it was also a big coordination problem to work with the developers in India for a lot of reasons. And I'll get to that in a moment. One big problem for me at the point in time was that we were using a software which, was, which only worked on Apple machines. So while I have a MacBook Pro, uh, my developer uh, colleagues in India did not, most of them did not have Apple machines. So it was very difficult to communicate design with them because they just couldn't see even the file. And sometimes we would take screenshots and communicate via screenshots. It was quite messy. Another very important point and something potentially unique to our situation was that all our designs needed to be translated into Dutch. So NL is the shorthand for Netherlands or Nederland in Dutch. So I would, because I'm also not Dutch and I don't speak fluent Dutch, I would make the designs in English. And then one of the Dutch product managers would translate them into Dutch. 
and if anybody has ever worked in uh, this kind of context this kind of internationalization uh, context you know it can really mess up the design so that was another blocker for us and finally it was hard to collaborate so i think it is it's very important in the design process to to collaborate with most of the stakeholders if not all the key stakeholders and going back and forth in files maintaining versions it was a mess so so what happened so i keep trying different design tools because i want to keep improving and i was just playing with figma one day just playing with it and just checking it out so to say and then i shared the figma file with one of the product managers in netherlands who was also a former accountant like i mentioned we typically hire former accountants into product roles because accounting is a very very subject matter specific field you really need to know the ins and outs and the laws to help shape the product so he was also a former accountant just joined and i shared the figma file with him and he was able to make small tweaks to it so it was the very first time in his life that he was touching a design software and he was in his own way making a design and and i remember i still remember his words to us and his exact words was i am a designer and that was when sort of a bulb uh, went off in my mind that if this person who spent i think at least a decade studying accounting after 5 minutes of use feels that he is a designer and design is not something which is very special or magical or happens in closed rooms or done by geniuses but he can also do it that's when i thought that the way to scale design is to get these former accountants to get their hands on the design tool so that they feel that they can design so that's how my story started with figma and i what i did was to get more of them into board so like i showed you showed you vivek so to get vivek on board and other pos of india on board i had a very small figma training with them in which i just asked them to make a button that's what i told them that we'll have a one hour session you have to do nothing you don't need to know any design this is a button let's sit together and make a button and the idea is that my idea was that once they get their hands on the tool once they feel it physically that they can move things around and they can make things then they will be on board with the design process and that's what really happened so from a small button we went to these very complex figma files and i'll jump into them now to show you how we actually work all right so we are in this massive figma file uh if you see this is all the number of pages we have in this file this is for a product called fiscal which is our tax product and you can see that uh we almost broke figma so we have so many screens here with so much discussion that we can't add more we actually broke the limits of figma and we have if you can see my screen we have 333 comments on the file so a lot of them also unread so this is the deep level of collaboration we do and i'll show you in slightly more detail how we started so what typically would happen is that uh wait a second let me just zoom into one page of our product so for example this is one page of our product it's mostly in dutch but you don't need to understand that so what vivek would do or the accountant turned designer would do is not start with a blank slate but start with um some design which i already made and then he would make changes on this page then he would basically uh, move things around change the language change the terms see how things look and then he would he would just offer that to me and then we would discuss okay what's happening sometimes he would make comments on the file itself so you can see that he was struggling with how to arrange these form fields which are about dutch finances and we have this weird space in between so he would sometimes comment directly on the page saying hey gorov can you suggest that if we in should we increase the length of description field for second section so he's asking me within the file can i just increase this or not will this look weird because this name is very small but this field is very big so this kind of intense details we would go into so typically i would have a meeting with him then and i would know where he is we would further discuss options and then within the file 
we would again write hey what is happening after the meeting and then after meeting we we basically came up with this idea that we can put those fields here so that this space doesn't look weird and this is a more cleaner interface for our user so this is roughly how we would do it and once we were very clear that this is what we want the user to see experience and go through the flow then it would come to me for the final touching up and polishing and then we would put it in what we called at that time final design for development file so i'll just show it to you quickly so then this design file would become the the uh, let us say the spot for developer flow so you can already see we have something called sprint time so developer sprints this is the income section of our tool these are some dates about when it was done and this is like the high fidelity design which the developer uh, would look at and then they would have no confusion about okay what is the font size what is the color what is the spacing they have all of it in figma right here and later this process evolved even further and developers also became part of this process which you can see in these files so these are actually jira tickets which made it to our figma files and there's a lot of mess in here but i am also okay with showing you all of this mess because i think design process is at the end uh, quite messy uh, it, this is how the things are made and it's quite messy but ultimately it results in a very good product everybody is very satisfied everybody is on on the same page with what we are doing so this is how we work and yeah that's that's our story um thank you for that Amazing! That, that was awesome. Okay, thank you so much. <clears throat> uh, we we do have we have a few questions. Oh, okay. um, yeah, you can go ahead and stop sharing, and and we'll we'll probably save most of the questions uh, for for after the next talk as well. Um, but I think you know you raised uh, you know the. the this brings a good point. Like, should should designers be accountants? I, and I think it's something that we'll have to make sure we go back to as well. Um, okay. Great. Yeah. If you don't mind, stop sharing there. We'll we'll, we'll, yeah, we'll yeah, uh, yeah. move on to, to to Matt here as well. And again, any questions for for, for God, uh, definitely just drop them into the Q and A for now, and we will uh, make sure that we get through all questions for both speakers at the end here too. So awesome. And with that, I will go ahead and pass it off to Matt. And Matt, go ahead and uh, take it away. Brilliant. Thanks, Anthony. Just bear with me. Cool. Can you see that? Okay, okay. Great. That's great. Thanks, Anthony. <laughs> right. So um, today I'm going to be talking about uh, unusual use cases for Figma. Um, and in my case, I'm going to be talking about uh, doing that with marketing. So the name of my talk is how productivity unlocks creativity. That's really a theme that's gonna run through the whole talk. So I'll elaborate on exactly what I mean by that um, and how I'm using that in different ways. But first of all, uh, let me introduce myself. Um, so that's my uh, nine month old Mia. Um, that's us going for a walk in Victoria Park. Um, my name is Matt Sochivko. It's, uh, it's like a Polish spelling of a white Russian uh, surname. Um, I'm a digital marketer, uh, background is in startups. Um, I've been doing marketing for, I don't know, 11, 12 years, something like that. I've also worked as a creative, um, producing video content uh, for brands and that kind of thing, and also doing a fair amount of uh, copywriting. But crucially, I'm not a designer. Okay, that's fundamental to my talk. Um, and, you know, and, and that, that will become clear. Um, I've worked in B2C and B2B. And um, now, because I'm working with Elswin, a lot of our clients are B2B themselves. Uh, I'm working B2B2B, if that makes any sense. So I've been at Elswin for the past two years as head of marketing, getting the kind of marketing function up and running. And now we've got a really good team. Um, so you can find me on Twitter, uh, at Copy by Matt. Any questions, anything I talk about, anything, you know, you just want to uh, have a chat. Um, DMs are open. Um, and on Instagram, a bit more tricky because it's got my name. It's uh, at Matt Sushipko. And of course, go check us out at elsewhen.com. So who are Elswine? Well, we're a digital product consultancy. So what that means is we help leaders harness a cutting edge approach to design and technology to deliver a positive impact to their organizations. 
Um, we've been around for 10 years. In that time, we've had over 100 client engagements. Uh, the team is between sort of 40 and 50 people. And everyone in that team uh, on average has 12 years experience. That's a big part of our USP is that we only hire and work with uh, very senior professionals on client engagements. Uh, commercially, we're doing okay. 30% uh, year on year growth, and that's with uh, zero external investment. So um, you can just see some of our customers, uh, some of our clients. So you got Google, Microsoft, MasterCard, um, some cool brands, consumer brands like Spotify and Asus in there as well. So what do we do for those guys? Well, we got uh, three partners, uh, sorry, we help our partners in three distinct ways, digital strategy, project teams, and enterprise. Um, that's kind of the end of my pitch of Elswen. Um, if you want to know more, go and check out the website. Uh, so how do we use Figma? Well, as well as for marketing and the kind of stuff that I'm going to talk about, uh, we use it in the same ways everyone does, right? Um, prototyping, user journeys, uh, brand creation. Uh, we build design systems, sometimes contribute design systems. We do all that in Figma. This is some real project work that you can see on the right. Now, I did want to talk about one piece of project work really quickly, um, just because I think it's kind of interesting. Um, so this was with Spotify Design. We've done a lot of stuff with, with, uh, with them, but this is something, this lives on Spotify.design. So uh, after the talk, um, go and check it out. It's basically, it's a Figma toolkit. There's also a supporting article to kind of give you the context and the background of how it works. So it's, it's a tool for the community to use. Um, it's made up of a workshop, uh, sort of user interviews, um, a overall workflow that you can create, and then a productivity canvas, and there's outputs off the, off the back of that. And all of this was possible with Figma, obviously, you know, um, they're, all the components are locked. So you can use this, and you can kind of drop your post-its in, um, go through this all, and uh, auto layout means you can type things in and nothing breaks. Um, and obviously the project wiki is kind of in the tool as well. You can see that pagination as well. Um, so what is this thing for? Uh, it's about uh, defining, measuring, and then improving uh, design productivity. So as we call it the design productivity blueprint. And you run through these stages, you know, workshop with your design team, running through uh, user interviews, finding those pain points and opportunities in the, in the workflows, and then taking them out. Anyway, go and check it out. It's on Spotify Design. And that's an example of the other kind of Figma work we do. So I want to talk about this idea of productivity, unlocking creativity, um, and kind of unpick uh, what I mean by that. That was something um, that really came up in that piece of Spotify Design work as well. But basically, Figma has really allowed us to uh, explore the relationship between productivity and creativity. Uh, and what this means is that when you kind of, you know, if you think of like a workflow, you know, like, like a, and there's this series of tasks that you're working through to get to a desired outcome, uh, there's, there's, there's pain points in there and there's, there's different people working in there and there's, there's all these things there, right? So there's all these things that you could improve in a workflow. And basically what we kind of discovered, what we uncovered is that when you improve processes, you don't just kind of become more efficient. You don't just improve efficiency. You create the time, the space and the bandwidth for people to be creative, right? And by that, I mean, to do their best work, okay? I'm gonna talk about how that's really been huge for me as a marketer, but also, you know, workflows that, that, that involve designers and engineers as well. So where do we use for uh, Figma for marketing? So really quickly, I'll just show you some of the kind of uh, the outputs, if you like, um, the different places that, that we need to use Figma to, to get live. So we produce white papers. This is the most recent one on embedded finance. Obviously our website, um, you know, for marketing, it's gonna be part of your marketing strategy at some point is your, your website with a destination for people to, excuse me, to learn about you. Um, we produce case studies, you know, about past client en engagements. This is a real, uh, um, you know, uh, case study file in Figma. So this is for our work in Bupa. You can see the desktop breakpoint there and then this tablet next to that and there's mobile. Uh, we do it for partnerships. So that piece of work, you know, um, that we did for the design community, for the design ops community with Spotify Design, that, that would kind of broadly come under that, that banner of the partnerships. And finally, we have these kind of uh, one-off standalone campaigns. Okay, so in this case, this was for 
uh, a webinar, much like the one uh, I'm doing now. It's obviously part of Figma's marketing strategy. It is for Elsewhere as well. Um, this is a, a webinar that we put on that was um, very successful um, with three really great um, uh, innovation leaders. So I need the audience because I know I'm talking to people all around the world um, who are fundamentally, you know, primarily you guys are designers, right? You're design leaders and you're designers and there's design ops and people in there. So I need you to kind of get into the mindset of thinking like a marketer. So every marketer, broadly speaking, has two goals. Lead gen, you know, you've got to kind of get the customers in the door one way or another. You've got to get their emails. You've got to get them to sign up. Um, you've got to get them to download the app, whatever it may be. And then you have, you've got to, you, you're doing brand awareness. You're growing the brand. You know, you're boosting the credibility of the brand. And the way you're doing this is you're always running multiple campaigns across multiple channels, okay? So maybe you're doing cold email, yeah? It's a pure channel. Maybe you're putting on conferences. Um, so you're running uh, campaigns, uh, you know, uh, um, to promote your, your, your conference appearance. Uh, for all of those, you have to be running experiments, learning and iterating, okay? Um, and that's running experiments on the macro level so, okay, you know, maybe you're thinking about the whole channel. Maybe conferences are going to be big, big for us. And that's really going to put us on the map um, versus the, the more micro. Okay, I've got my conference uh, sort of promotion campaign running, uh, but it's not quite delivering. I need to be able to, you know, play around with the copy. Let me A-B test the positioning of how I'm talking about this. Let me A-B test uh, the visuals, the way we're presenting this, you know. Um, and in marketing, there's always strict deadlines, okay? Um, that's because there's a commercial imperative. Uh, you know, it's tie tied to the sales goals of, of a company, right? You know, you've got those, everyone talks about the quarterly kind of sales targets and things. But then there's also, you know, you're running a campaign for a webinar. The webinar is taking place. Uh, it's a non-starter to not have an audience, right? You know, we need to get those leads in. We need to run a successful campaign to make this webinar a success. And... I hate using this word, but resource uh, is frequently scarce, meaning, uh, you know, marketing is a team sport and uh, frequently you, you, you don't have uh, the designers, uh, the engineers, you know, their, their time is precious um, in, in an agency or consultancy like ours. So this is how we used to get assets live, right? Um, I'm sure everybody's familiar with a Kanban board. This is a real Kanban board that I've kind of um, blocked out the sections for. So you can see there's a series of briefings happening, design briefing and so on. Uh, there's layers of sign off, you know, the design's been signed off. Now the, the, the development's been signed off. Um, you're, you're starting from scratch at each handoff, okay? You're not collaborating. Um, you're, you're, you know, I'm briefing the designer, they're creating designs, they're handing off to a developer. Uh, there's no shared spaces. Um, I hope I'm not, this isn't a dirty word, but we were using Sketch uh, and InVision, right, for our, for our design process, like, like lots of people, I think, once upon a time. Um, so crucially, if a designer is working and living in Sketch, you know, it's, we, we have no visibility. It's very difficult for stakeholders, for different people to give feedback, to have visibility. They then port that to InVision. If there's a problem, they've got to take it back to Sketch. They've got to re-upload it to InVision and so on. So lots and lots of pain points. And I'm sure everybody in the audience is familiar with those. But there's one really big pain point for me, which is that this workflow just isn't built for marketing, right? I just broke down you know, the mindset of a marketer. Uh, so uh, we had these list of pain points that we really, really wanted to tackle, You know, really rethink this workflow. How can a marketer get high quality assets when she needs them? And how can a designer's time be spent just working on delivering great designs, you know, rather than stuck in extended painful briefing sessions with me um, or, you know, uh, duplicating lots and lots of designs for a campaign? How can we get feedback to a designer um, earlier and more easily, you know? Uh, how can everyone inhabit the same space? How can we have a workflow that has marketers, designers, um, engineers, clients, whoever it may be, third parties, partners, all living in the same workflow. And how, um, you know, the time spent on repetitive, low impact tasks is time wasted. Everybody in this, in, the, in their old workflow was spending an awful lot of time on these repetitive tasks, okay? So we decided to rebuild this campaign process in Figma. Um, and uh, we started with the landing pages. So um, it's a bit scary doing a live demo. 
but let's jump into, uh, let's see. So let me just, what I might need to do is, uh, is share my screen and I'm gonna jump into my Google Chrome. There we go. Okay, so here I am. So I'm building landing pages um, here in, in Figma. And crucially, uh, these are pages that were uh, completely pulled together um, uh, by myself and, and my director, Leon. So our designer has created the, the components. Um, they've created the blocks, the things we need that, that, that are mapped to our production website. You can see, you know, my, my sort of sketchy, sketchy brief there. Um, and then I can take one of those blocks, you know, perhaps I'm working on a landing page and I think, you know what, we want to have multiple calls to action on this web page. Let's pull the, uh, the white paper in there. Okay, so now I'm pulling in that white paper creative. Perhaps we look through and we go, you know what, this testimonial is really not relevant. So we just kill that, um, you know, get some feedback, get some insight. The designer can still play a role here. So a designer can be, look, you know, look at this and go, okay, looks good, Matt. Um, it's a bit too left, everything's on the left and images on the right. Let's play around with it. Let's, let's flip them left and right. And we had, you know, all the blocks that allowed us to do that. And also they can go, you know what, this visual, it's not kind of working for me. Um, that's great you spent all this time getting this design done, freed up my time. Let me see if I can find an asset that can really make this sing. So it means we can get sophisticated, beautiful uh, marketing campaigns live extremely quickly. Myself as a marketer, I'm fully autonomous. Um, and, you know, we've got agile is a much overused phrase, but, but this is agile. Yeah. So bear with me. I'm going to have to kind of I'm using multiple screens. I'm going to stop sharing and then I'm going to jump back into my, uh, my keynote. Okay. So that was the landing page. Now that's kind of step one. Um, I wanted to give you something that I think could potentially really be a bit more of a, uh, a game changer for marketing. So bear with me. On my practice, this wasn't so painful to go backwards and forwards between uh, sort of Figma and Chrome. But um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump into this project on the right. Perhaps before I do that, I'll tell you a little bit about what it is. So you can, this is basically uh, add creatives for a campaign. You can see my master components at the top, and then you can see the different creatives in there. So let's do the same thing. Let's jump in. Uh, I'm sure there's, there's a much easier way to do this, but there you go. We're in. Okay, so I'm jumping in here, and this is a, this is a real campaign, by the way. This is this is for our most recent white paper. Okay, so I can play around with my uh, my assets here. I've got my cover image, and perhaps I play in here, and I go, you know what? Uh, I'm not too keen on this image. Let's play around with this. Um, let's figure out where on earth do I put this. Um, uh, trying to remember where I put things now. Okay, there we go. Just not, yeah. So now you can see I've got that image and it started to pull that into different um, layouts. And you can see I'm playing around with this, that orange and pink is uh, really something. Uh, so that's something I maybe need to change up. But equally, I'm going to change up my copy. Um, I think the talk is going well. Screen sharing is tricky. Um, and then you can see that that's, that's, that's playing out across all my different creatives. OK, so straight away, I'm iterating. I can do this every day. How do I promote this white paper? Okay, how do I make it effective? What is, it, what is the imagery? You know, really quickly, it's easy to, for me to produce multiple assets, any color, you know, for any creative, any channel size. I mean, this is quite a simple, straightforward one. You've kind of got these landscape and I've got some, uh, some, some kind of uh, more square ones here that will be improving more effectively. And, you know, and you can see the, the really awful designs <laughs> that I've been creating um, in, in playing around with this. Cool, so I'll jump back into Keynote. So, so when I was thinking about this, um, I was thinking about the other talk, which is really interesting, which is about having accountants um, living in Figma. And I was thinking, okay, 
I'm going to be speaking to a load of design leaders here and they're probably thinking, oh, this is cool. And yeah, that's a nice workflow, but with the best will in the world, my design team live over here. My marketing team, you know, live somewhere else. There's a CMO, there's like design principles. There's all this kind of bureaucracy between me and them. And I was thinking, how can I answer that question? How do you get marketers to use Figma? And I think that that rapid iteration of playing around with the, with the ad creators really quickly, um, you know, uh, getting what you need as a marketer, you know, using Figma as a really effective tool to help you run effective marketing, to really quickly iterate, um, put, push live new assets. So if we look at the outcomes of, you know, this whole process of what we, what we achieved in undertaking this, you can see that, you know, a marketer can pull together campaigns on her own, you know, entirely. Uh, we've got rapid ad creative creation and also um, iteration. Uh, designers live entirely in the visual assets where they want to live. You know, let's, let me see if I can improve this imagery um, and, and work on it. Um, oops. Sorry, I've jumped out of my deck. Oh my God. Okay. So this last slide is useful. Okay, so bear with me. So what are the outcomes from that talk? How can you get marketers to start using Figma? So mar the marketer can start pulling together campaigns on her own. Um, you've got that rapid ad creative creation and iteration. The designers live where they wanna live, just inside of the visual assets. Um, all of those components that you saw, you know, in Figma um, and the building blocks to pull together landing pages um, with this idea of productivity, unlocking creativity, it meant that our developers got in on the action as well. And they thought, okay, this is so easy now for me to push these landing pages live. Maybe I can duplicate these components in Storybook. Okay, so, you know, they, they had that bandwidth to think creatively. Um, Everyone in the workflow is working in the same space. Um, you know, your performance agency uh, could be in Figma. You know, if you if you if you got uh, working with a third party ad agency, they could be in Figma as well. There's no reason not, and they can just quickly grab the assets. Um, using this approach, we have pub uh, published multiple successful campaigns. Everything you saw, multiple white papers, multiple webinars. Um, you know, multiple campaigns across multiple channels. We did that using this. So. It's really been a game changer for marketing. Sorry for uh, a couple of my technical issues with my screen sharing, but there you go, we live and learn. Um, so that's how improved productivity unlocks creativity. So thanks a lot. I can see Anthony's popped up. So I'm uh, copied by Matt on Twitter, uh, Matt Sachitko on Instagram. Um, we didn't put, there's a couple of tools there. They, they're not yet on the Figma community. That's something that we'd love to do. If people are interested in that, let me know and I can, I can put, pull the pieces together to get that done. Otherwise, uh, check us out uh, elsewhere.com. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome. That was great, Matt. And, and uh, yeah, I think we, we all, we're all doing what we can with the screen sharing and the <laughs> switching Sorry between apps. That. So yeah, yeah. There's, a, there's a human element to it, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm always, I'm always Go multiple back and screens forth. with multiple devices. So. Right, right, right. <laughs> awesome. Great. So we are going to move on to a uh, Q&A portion of uh, the talk now. So um, for anyone who had questions, uh, either for uh, Garav or, or Matt, like, uh, please uh, keep those questions coming in. Um, we like to do it in this style only so that um, I, I have pointed questions for, for different people, but uh, both of you feel free to answer if you have context or anything like that that you want to add to any of the questions as we're going through as well. And I might actually just stop sharing so that you can just see our faces here as well. So. Great. Um, uh, Garav, start, starting with you, we had some great questions come in, uh, mainly just around um, uh, Stefano had, had asked, uh, did you build the design system from scratch and how did you, how did you collaborate with any front end engineers, uh, on that as well? So not only the design side of it, but were you working closely with any of the, the developers as well? Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I should have taken you through that. So we did make a design system. Uh, we made first a basic design system. Now we're working on an advanced one. So when we working on the basic design system, um, it was the same process basically. Invite the front end developer into the Figma file. So almost everybody in, in the development team and so all developers, all the POs and me, we all have access to the same files as long as you're in the same product. 
So I would get the sort of front end lead in the Figma file. He would ask me questions about how does it actually work because sometimes those things can be tricky to interpret because you're looking at static screens. So you would just discuss, he would ask some things, for example, what would happen if we hover on this, those kind of things, we would clear our doubts and then he would take it forward from there to storybook or to other things. But Makes so sense, yeah. just, just a small addition, typically, uh, so Figma works as a whiteboard for us. So even before Corona times, because the bulk of the team or developers are in India, this was basically our whiteboard. So, hey, this is the whiteboard. This is the thing. Just come to me. What do you want to understand? And we just solve it together. Awesome. Yeah. And, and I know, Matt, you had mentioned a little bit of that too at the end there was sort of like how they're looking at those components in Storybook and how, how they might be bringing some of those pieces in and seeing those connections. Yeah, this talk could have been 10 times longer because there's kind of the, the next bit and the next bit. It's kind of, we're, we're, we're iterating on the process I ran through. So yeah, that's really cool. Yeah. Um, uh, Matt, Matt, I want to switch to you for, for, for a question here too. Um, how, how big is your marketing team? Or well, what are the other tools that you're using to make sure that, that everyone's not feeling siloed. Um, this is a question from Mia and um, love, should, uh, love that you spoke about designers and marketers collaborating together. How do, you how do you keep them from being siloed? Are there other tools for that? Um, yeah, it's a good question. I think this is often something that we, we've been lucky because this is something that we help our clients with, right? Um, you know, we, we've helped clients with things like design ops um, with looking at, you know, workflows, how they work with, with other teams, you know, how you integrate, how do you collaborate at scale? Because, you know, um, to answer the other part of that question, we've got a pretty small marketing team. We're a mid-sized agency, but we work with enormous, you know, multinational organizations. So we, 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 we've done the hard miles of trying to bring this thinking into our clients. And therefore, you know, we're just trying to make sure we, we are on dog food and, and follow the same principles. So, yeah. And um, in awesome. terms of marketing, I don't think there's any, in terms of tooling, there's, there's no kind of secret source, I don't think, other than what I shared with Figma. We're using the same stuff everyone uses, I think, you know, HubSpot and, you know, um, various ad tools and things like that. There's, um, you know, Notion and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah. So, so actually, in building off that point on, on HubSpot, uh, another, we had another question from, from Cindy just around, how are you measuring those landing pages? Like, and, and if they if they use HubSpot, is, is that, that sounds like you have a, a good um, process there in place for, for Figma and using HubSpot simultaneously? Uh, I'm trying to think of how to answer this in, in a short way. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 very, it's very involved, I suppose. Um, the key is to think about, so for us, um, the, that, that marketing cycle, that sales cycle is, is going to be quite a lot longer than, you know, for, for a consumer brand, right? So the way that we think about it is um, basically all of those landing pages are working as touches, which are warming up a lead, okay? You know, there's a big difference between generating a kind of a marketing qualified lead. So we might say, Oh, there's this guy, Anthony uh, Despetio. He looks like a really strong lead. You know, he's relevant for our services, but perhaps he's only signed up for one of our webinars. Okay. So it's, it's really about how would we warm up Anthony to get him to that point where he's a bit more interested in learning about what to elsewhere actually do. You know, maybe you're interested in a, a talk that we put on, but it's that process. So those, those landing pages and those processes, they kind of have to be tied to, um, you know, uh, what what your wh where the lead is in that journey and some of them are far more transactional something like a google search campaign is going to be hey do you want to work with us here's what we do you know and then there's things that are much less transactional which are like hey check out our white paper you know you might find this interesting right so it's Got it. yeah mm -hmm. sorry that's a that's a big subject <laughs> But, yeah. City, if you if you've got more, you you you've you've got uh you've got Matt's Twitter, so I'm sure you could uh, exactly. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> track him down and ask some more questions there too as well. Um, uh, kind of, I want to go back to you. Um, um, uh, mm -hmm. and, and actually, maybe, maybe this is a question for for both two as well. Um, uh, uh Sunil, I hope hope I'm saying that right, has a great question on. As a non-designer, uh, you, you mentioned a little bit of your entry process for getting non-designers uh, to, to get comfortable with Figma. Now that's a 
that's a big transition, especially for anyone who has not used an interface design tool before. You're moving into a space where you've got you know, a canvas versus just having a, a more organized sort of menu system or anything like that, which sounds kind of small, but can be a big deal. Um, what were the challenges and, and what might be any, any recommendations for, for anyone just getting started? Yeah, so I think I mentioned a part of it before. Uh, so basically, it's about a bit about conversations and sort of a training. So as I mentioned that I tried to get them to make a button. I consistently told them, hey, this is just a rectangle. We are just making rectangles. We're not doing rocket science here. Because the point is they have to draw it. Once they draw that rectangle, and if this is the first rectangle they're drawing a design software, they're already convinced that they can do something because they see the result right away. And the mm -hmm. other thing which, which also helped a lot in getting them on board was that now if they draw a blank white rectangle when they want to solve a product problem, then of course they're not going to be happy with it so, or mm -hmm. because a, a blank page is always intimidating. So what I did was I had some initial designs prepared. So typically, as you saw, we make tax software. It's a lot of form fields and labels and a lot of user input. So I had some of them prepared. And what they still do is they don't start from scratch. They take one of those frames and they start editing it. So that's always easier to edit something which exists rather than make something from scratch. So, and once they are on that flow, then their confidence builds up and then it just rolls. And then- Can we talk that also? Oh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> no, no, I was just, I saw a comment like, uh, dang those layers. So that's what, uh, <laughs> that's what happens when they, they really get it, but yeah. Sorry, yeah. Me. Would you say that that also extends to, oh, so, so even, even for the people doing design work, but as far as developers getting in, into the file as well, would you, would you recommend the same process or are there specific things that you'd want? Because if a developer is coming from, say, a tool like uh, Envision or Zeppelin or, or, you know, more of where they're inspecting designs and things like that, um, mm -hmm. is, it, is it basically the same recommendation or do you have other things that you might focus on to, to help them feel more familiar or comfortable? Actually, I didn't feel, oh, oh yes, sorry. Okay, I'll just say one thing. Yeah, go the, the developers which I worked with were not uncomfortable at all. Hmm. So at least in my experience, they, they get it much faster. The, the accounting turned POs had a big barrier, but developers were already comfortable. They, at least the ones I worked with didn't have any problem. So, yeah. Nice, nice. Yeah, I was going to say, I, so I'd echo that, that um, developer, you know, Figma is very developer friendly um, for the most part. Um, obviously, I'm not a developer. I, the way I think about it always is in terms of like outcomes, right? You know, what, what, what do you achieve? If you can show them what it can unlock and the power behind something, you know, then, then it becomes really meaningful. It's like when you're a kid and you have piano lessons and the piano teacher teaches you a song like Beethoven and you have zero interest, you're like, it's gonna be a long time before I learn to play piano. You know, if you can show them and bring them in and see the outcome, you know, the outcomes, you know, pull them in and understand, you know, it's, it's, it's like back to product methodology, like jobs to be done, right? What, what are they trying to achieve? You know, get into their, their headspace and then go, hey, look, give this a while, this could do X, Y, Z for you. And then as soon as I think, as soon as they can see the use case, then, then they're in and they'll start playing around with it. You know? No, that's great. Yeah, and and I, I mean, I would I would just second that as well too. That like, the more shared language, the more shared tooling, the more shared space that you have there, the let the more connectivity you're going to have, not only in a in a tactical level, but also just in the way that you communicate. And you have so much less opportunity for things to to go awry or to or to be different. So it's it's nice when I get to to talk about <laughs> when we're all in the same space together. We're all we're all talking in the same languages, which is nice. So. A mm. um, yeah. couple more questions here too that I want to get to, um, uh, and and for for Matt, this is actually a, one that that I was very interested in. Um, on a technical level, for something like a campaign, and and maybe uh, if this works for you too, I'd be interested mm -hmm. in both your answers mm -hmm. here. But um, for something as a campaign, right, where you're constantly sort of creating and re and releasing and and dropping new things, how would you organize that? Either you know. Like, at the project level, at the file level, like how do you sort of ensure that you've got consistency in that um, campaign and you're able to go back to previous ones or you're able to plan for your next ones and things like that? Is there any tips or tricks you have there? 
Um, I mean, it's hopefully you're, you're running the campaign, so you're, you're you're duplicating, right? So you so at a very basic mm -hmm. level, you've got your Figma file, you've got your landing pages, you're learning, right? You you you've kind of got your wins already. You know, you've got your first kind of insights on like, okay, this kind of works. Having my call to action here kind of works. Having this kind of imagery kind of kind of works. So you should never really be starting from scratch again, right? You should be, you know, if you even if you've never um, done uh, put on a promoted a campaign for a design conference, you should be taking all, a lot of the good learnings that you took from your accounting conference, right? You know, and it's it's, it's the same kind of principle. So, um, yeah, that's it on on, on a very kind of um, base level. Um, and really for me, it's, it's when you have uh, the marketer being the person who's using the tool actively, who's also the project owner, who's also the person who has visibility of the whole thing holistically, there's much, much less that can go wrong. If you're briefing people and you have to brief them on every kind of minute detail of the campaign and how they, what they have to be thinking about, there's, there's, a danger, there's an innate danger there. So letting people be hands-on and be, be in the tool and just having that visibility and the ability to change things, it's a lot easier, mm -hmm. you know. Um, oh, Nike don't like their swoosh there. Okay, I can just fix it as opposed to, you know, furiously texting a designer and can you fix the campaign assets and things like that, so yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. And then Gav, maybe, maybe same to you. Do you have any tips or yeah. tricks either for campaigns or maybe for iterations on designs and things like that, yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, I think so. so um, one good analogy for the way uh, the Figma file is structured is think of the kitchen in a restaurant and the restaurant table. So on the table, you want everything neat, clean, ready to be consumed. In the kitchen, you know how kitchens work, right? So, so I would say in our Figma file, we have, I would say 95% of the pages are the kitchen. Where, was, where there's a lot of mess, everybody can jump in, people make all sorts of notes, red color fonts, all of that stuff happens. But then to make sure we are consistent, what we have is that one, one page called final design for development and nobody's allowed to touch it apart from me. So then it's my job to make 100% sure that when it gets served for the users or even for the developers of final development, then it has no itches or scratches. So that is one way. The second way is also we have regular review sessions after they are developed. So I also review them. Then we like sort of clean up the kings. So these regular review sessions and having that restaurant table that makes, that helps us in keeping consistent. And moving forward, we are, as I slightly mentioned, we are working on a more advanced design system right now. And that's also in Figma. And we, we very strongly believe that this will help us be even more consistent. Awesome. Yeah. And that's, yeah. It, and that, that is a great analogy to the, 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 the restaurant. I like it. There's a great, um, there's a, a rather like seminal talk uh, or, or I guess blog post now a while ago by Brad Frost called the workshop in the storefront. A very similar concept. It's about okay, yes. creating yeah front doors, not necessarily for your customers, but for your actual partners and the people that are going to be consuming your design systems and actually you need to work with as well. So um, for anyone who wants some more reading, there's some, there's some good stuff there too. Yeah, um, the yeah one, um, one question for, for, for both of you is, um, given that, that, that you both have work that, that seems to be in multiple languages, do you have any recommendations as far as how do you, how do you sync designs and translations? Are you working in multiple languages? How are you translating things? Is there anything on that front in Figma uh, that, that you could uh, recommend? Um, or is it done manually? What's what's the process there? And let's start with, um, let's go with, uh, Gaurav, uh, why don't we start with you if you've got any, <laughs> anything there? Yeah, so actually um, we, we, so at least in the design phase, we are not using uh, anything. So we first uh, solve the problem, so to say, focus on that, we don't focus on the language. And then what I know that some of the POs have a simple Google sheet because the Google translate is not the best solution. And we also have PMs and POs who are Dutch. So they come together and they prepare the Google sheet. So we first make the design in English and then through that Google sheet, we do the translation. But mm -hmm. it would be good if there is some sort of plugin, I don't know if it exists to help us do better. But frankly, yeah. this is also fine because then we would sort of mess up. Then we would be thinking too much about the language 
and but our focus refers on the user problem. So mm. that's basically makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, so exactly the same. So we had this on a client engagement um, for Zigo. So they're like a, the UK's largest insure tech. Um, they do things like uh, your Uber driver is, is like insured by, by Zigo. Um, and then we did the same thing. So it was, a, it was a Google Sheets um, integration. There is a plugin. Um, it's just called uh, Google Sheets Sync. Um, so that's it. So, so you had all of that data uh, um, plugging in, um, and we were doing that. It was, it, it's cool. Um, I nearly showed that actually, um, because it was cool. You could see the Google Sheets data and how it was populating these very beautiful user journeys. So you could see that people, you know, even at that very early stage, um, you had kind of insurance policy experts, you know, super obscure stuff. They could see these beautiful user journeys, and it was, it was in all the right language and stuff like that. So yeah. So awesome. Google Sheets sync. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, definitely. And, and I'll add a, a little more context here too. I think, um, so I, I've worked with a, with a handful of our customers that, are, that have done this and there are there are full translation services that have plugins like, like Phrase and SmartLang and things like that. Uh, next layer down, there are, um, again, things like Google Sheets sync, Airtable sync. So if you've got your data, if you've got your length, your, you know, everything broken out into text fields, you can map those to a specific frames and in a, a, a specific text fields in the file, sync them. Um, you can even, um, uh, you know, you can duplicate a page uh, yeah, localize another great one, <laughs> um, and um, you can also um, uh, then duplicate the page, change the language, run a quick little rename to have it sync to a different sheet, just by renaming the name of the page, and then you can get different languages on a page by page basis like that, which is a, a nice homegrown approach to doing that too. Um, there's also pseudo localization uh, plugins, so it'll just sort of generate things to test ascenders and descenders and languages that you may not necessarily have thought about and as far as spacing and layout and things like that. And um, there's also even just ones where you can load in, load in your own dictionaries if you've got specific languages you're trying to test and you have a dictionary for that too. So um, lots of ways to go about it. Um, the Google Sheets sync, the syncing one is cool because it'll do more than just text. If you have image URLs and things like that, you can sync all different types of data. So uh, definitely check those out, they're pretty cool. Uh, all right, and with that, we are at time for today. Uh, I want to thank everyone for their awesome questions, and most of all, I want to thank our speakers today. I, I appreciate it. This was a really awesome talk. I always love uh, hearing a little bit more of the behind the scenes of how uh, people are doing their work, and you both did live demoing, which is so impressive, <laughs> and uh, I really respect that. Uh, somebody has to do that a lot, so <laughs> that was awesome. Um, for anyone uh, who's interested, you can check out all of our future live streams at Figma com slash events. We've got some great ones coming up. If you have ideas, if you might want to speak or, or, or anything that you want to hear us talk about, definitely send us stuff at community at figma.com. Um, and lastly, just one more time, thank you to our speakers today. And thanks for everyone for joining. Uh, hope you had a great time and we will see you next time. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you.